namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa buddhang dhammang sanggang namasami sabapasa akaranang kusala supa sampadang sacitta pariyota panang etang burana sasananti So good morning everyone and uh, welcome to this Sunday talk. So it's a time for calming the mind down and considering Dharma in our minds. And in particular I like to bring attention to Lumpur Pliam who is sitting on my right, the frame the picture frame who passed away on on February the 15th this year at 3 p.m. at his kuti after having a series of operations in his internal organs at the age of 88 I believe and uh, and they, they are keeping his body uh, there at his kuti I believe until November in mid-November which is his birthday and uh, this is the tradition that it's roughly almost a year and uh, that they will keep it for for people throughout Thailand and even from uh, throughout the world will come to pay respects and show their deep gratitude towards him so this is a quality that dates back to the time of the Buddha showing deep respect to the to the Sarvok, the Arya Sarvoks of the time of the Buddha, the noble disciples of the Buddha, when they passed, when they passed away from this life, abandoned the five candors. And there's a sign in front of his kuti: these candors are of no use; they are to be abandoned, and so forth. So this is a quite a powerful statement. So it's probably it's uh, made to give an, inc- an idea of the level of his practice and uh, usually uh, it's a subtle, subtle uh, point of reference there and so too uh, these five candors of uh, body of this body, of these feelings they're all just a heap so all this body is one big heap with all its organs and so forth and this feelings, all the various types of feelings, good, happy, sad and so forth are another heap and all our memories from the past and even now like a photo album full of our life, full of showing our history of our life which we hold on to dearly is another heap and everything we see in the world is also part of those memories, you know, this is me, this is my car, this is my house and so forth, all these conventions uh, gathered also into that memory, that heap. And finally, and secondly, also the, uh, the quality of uh, conscious, of uh, volitions, mental formations, such as our mind states, sometimes happy, sometimes sad, sometimes revengeful, sometimes content, sometimes peaceful, sometimes willing to cooperate, sometimes not willing to cooperate, and so forth, on and on and go, and all the possibilities that are possible that we can think, all the notions that we can conjure up is another heap. And then finally our consciousness, and that is we are conscious of eyes, what we see in front of us. We are conscious of sounds that we hear and we acknowledge. And we are conscious of our nose, the flavours that we, that we, are, that we can uh, savour. We are conscious of our tastes and preferences of certain food and not preferences of certain food and consciousness of feelings, touch, pleasant touch um, ple- touch that's not so pleasant such as cold weather where we need to warm ourselves up or hot weather where we need to wear light clothing and so forth and then finally just consciousness of our own mind and how it, it's totally been affected by all these other other rising aspects of consciousness and that is another heap 
in brief is the five, uh, the five uh, aggregates of clinging are suffering. So, so when this statement I noticed on his kuti is saying that's all been abandoned, it's been all abolished, so to, so to say. And he didn't say it directly himself or what, but it's a generally a famous phrase by the Lord Buddha to say that don't, don't attach to these five candors. They're not, they're not worthy to honour and attach. They should, be, they should be just that for us as a vehicle. This, this, this whole body mind experience is a vehicle to tr transcend it, to purify it, to reach that state. And so we, we aspire for all that. And, uh, and this is uh, very important that we consider that, that it is possible for us to transcend these uh, five, five heaps that are, that are making us uh, very heavy and weighted down because of our attachment to them. And so I, as monks do, we, we, uh, we, we create a little shrine, we put a picture frame up and flowers and a, and, uh, and a Buddha Rupa candle incense and, uh, and uh, regularly uh, do some puja or, or show respect to that shrine because it's, uh, it's because he's no longer with us. So this is what we have that remains of him. And where is he? He doesn't... And, uh, and this is the thing, these great monks, where are they? Where have they gone? What is their future birth? And so forth. This is what we don't know. And same time with Lumpur Cha uh, and uh, Wapapong Sangha, when, when he passed away, all the monks building start would, he was, but he also remained for one year. And thousands and thousands of people would come and pay respects without any instigation or ordering for throughout the whole world. It was an uh, incredible sight. Unfortunately, I, this was prior to um, my going forth and my awareness of such things. I was far too uh, still involved in other worldly things to be aware of such things. But now uh, I've seen that with uh, some other great monks, some disciples of some of these great masters and uh, seen in building chedis and all this respect and uh, we, we, how do we know that they are a great master? And it's through his disciples and through all the people that have known him, have spent time with him, have practiced with him, and that lay community, or we can know him through the great books that he's written and that we uh, read and we get inspired by them. And this is how we can get intimate with, uh, with the Sangha and show our deep respect to these teachers. And so after putting up a shrine and uh, making it available here, this is not the practice here at BSV, so I was gr very grateful that they allowed me to do it and uh, because I, I knew of such a monk. And he also visited here. Lumpur Bliam did visit here and gave teachings. So uh, you're also honouring him by may allow me to do that. So, and it's being uh, pretty much based in Theravadan community uh, it was appropriate, but of course it's very circular and we have teachers also from Tibetan traditions and Mahayana traditions and, and uh, nuns from, from different traditions and so forth. So, so it's, uh, it's a very supportive environment for, for, for the Sangha, the greater Sangha, which is a uh, big Anamodana, such a very unique place, a unique quality. as we pause and we consider how is it that we show respect to these great masters and that is through our own practice for our own sincere practice what we've learned from him what they have taught us and what we have known them and spent time with them we can too exemplify in our lives I remember last year when I did spend with him for the last couple of months concerned that his health would decline and he might pass away and I wouldn't have a chance to pay respect to him before he passed away. 
in doing so, he made me feel very welcome and, uh, and uh, I could stay as long as I like. So that was, was uh, much, much uh, more than I could imagine. I thought I would only be able to visit for a week because he's a very large monastery, very busy, lots of monks, and there's no room. Maybe there's no room, but they accommodated me very kindly and also had many private chats and consultations with him on Dharma. And he's a monk that speaks very little, so it's a, a, you can ask, it's very hard to find time to speak with him because he is so much in demand, so many people. And thus, in Asia, people love to do make merit and love to honour these great monks and do merit. They are blessed with so much power in me. Wherefore in Australia it's rare to find uh, samanas, it's rare to find sangha, it's very small, small minority. And if it is, it's in other speaking countries and other speaking languages of other countries, so it's difficult for most of us to, to, uh, to associate with it because of the cultural language barrier. I remember one occasion when I was sitting with him, he would just, afterwards we would, uh, after receiving guests for three or four hours, we would, uh, we would retire for his walk for a little bit and then go for his evening bathe and walk around the monastery. And so that being the case, uh, one monk ready to receive his robe and uh, to look after that, another tender monk doing some other duties. And I, I just happened to be there just uh, just uh, enjoying his company, a rare opportunity. And he picked up a picture of himself, a huge, beautiful picture of himself. And he had many of, of himself. And he, he looked at it and he pointed, this is me, this is my body, and smiling. This is me, this is my body. Isn't it beautiful? I'm so proud of it. <laughs> and he laughed at it. It's like, you know, you know what a... What a what an illusion, what a trick of Mara, people taking pictures and seeing this body. There's, there's nothing special about this body at all. We're just laughing at it. It's like laughing. He has the last laugh. Wherefore, we don't. When we die, we still worry where we're going to go. We still have much negativity in the mind. So much have much unwholesome in the mind. So we're worried where we go. Even though we've done a lot of good, we still worry. We haven't yet achieved uh, achieved a, a stability, a foundation, having achieved the level of uh, winning the stream, having unshakable faith, unshakable confidence in all, in all moments in life. And thus if we attain this state, then we too will look at our picture and won't be so interested in adoring ourselves so much, so much concern for this body so much. It'll be just this body, that's what it is. It's just giving us service in this life. It's very clear there's been a division between this body and what we truly are, what we truly are, our potential for purity and understanding. And so it was too early for his bath and we would take him for a walk. And so we went for a walk around the monastery. And, uh, and it's a very large monastery and he walked very very carefully, step by step, and there was three of us. And uh, this was a rare occasion because that was only a few times he would do that at, at age. So I saw this was a rare occasion that he was going to do something. What has he installed? And, uh, and uh, they have this beautiful circuit road that goes throughout the forest and goes past through all the kutis. So we did a tour of the monastery before he went to have his evening bathe. And... Uh, and then as we were walking, we pass uh, first a group of kutis. And by, by just, by, by I don't know how it was possible, but how did they know? I really don't know. There was no one calling to say, he's coming by now, you better get out of your kuti. But every monk got out of their kuti. Every monk got out of their kuti and put their hands in the Anjali. It was incredible. And he was walking by, it was hair standing. I thought, this is incredible. How did they know? 
we weren't making any sound, we're just very speaking quietly and very mindful. And you could feel a great aura about him, feel the presence, you're really afraid to walk in front of him or stand too near him. Really had this quality, un unexplainable quality of uh, of utter security and freeness of all that we aspire for. And then we came to another area of the monastery where there was no kutis. And, uh, and uh, a group of dogs came. And they, they'd been there since the time he, he started that monastery, probably maybe a probably few generations of some of those dogs been there. So very elderly, some of them over 10 years of age. Some have passed away and been, you know, cubs of other dogs, of who, the original dogs there. It's sort of like they've always been there, They're like a group of dogs. And they all wanted to come up to him. They all wanted to jump on him, but they didn't. I, was, I could see them ready to jump, but something hold them back. It was incredible. They just stood there. They all just stand around him. And all he did is just raise his hand and put his hand out in front of them. And they bow down. <laughs> Here, again, all inspiring. They just all, and they started making sounds as if they were talking and whining and grunting. It was really quite a really eerie feeling. And he's just laughing, absolutely laughing, smiling. Of course, if you were an outsider, you would think, you know, he was just uh, uh, joking or, you know, being egotistical. But this is uh, how uh, people who have no understanding of respect, so then they don't see that this, uh, this stature, this, this great statue of, uh, you know, he is the only one really allowed to laugh, allowed to smile and have fun because he's not attached to any of that. There's no, un, there's no evil and wholesomeness. And like the Buddha, you know, with a beautiful smile, seeing the suffering of beings, he's not bothered. He's not, he's not up, angry or upset or fretted about it. Like we do when we see someone, like a children, our children, something goes wrong with them, problem, we get all angry or upset and we try to fix them and improve them and other people around us because we worry about them. We get all worry and worry, worry so much that we can't sleep and we're not even helping them. But we're doing all this worry, we're trying to help them or help other people. But in the end, we're not helping anyone. Well, with all these great monks, they just laugh. This is not, you know, and I, and I felt this sense of this, this quality, indescribable quality that you cannot explain it. It's very hard. For us in the world where we're so much caught in each other's affairs and we're trying to help each other, but we create so much worry and anxiety in the process of doing that. It shows how much we attach to our five candors. And that's not enough, we attach to another group of five candors. So we don't want to just have our own five candors that we're carrying around, but our wife, our children, so we end up with how many? We have a wife, that's another five, that's 10. And we have children, two children, that's 15. That's 20 candles we're carrying around. No wonder we're so parents are weighed down with worry so much. And so seeing this, and he was talking in Thai with him and saying that, you know, why one, one occasion that one, one man came to the village and uh, and to the monastery, and he did some bad deeds there in the monastery. Like one man chopped down a tree when he told him not to chop down a tree. And he, and he walked, and Lumpur Liam walked away, and this man continued to chop the tree. He didn't even call the police or anything. He said, you know, people are here to their karma, owner of their karma. What am I to do? Am I going to be responsible for their karma? If they want to do that, do I want to take that responsibility? I can't. If they want to do that, I've told them already. If they're that so foolish, let them be foolish. Let them see, receive, receive the result. And sure enough, the tree fell on him. He had to come out again <laughs> and say to him, you know, oh, help me, help me. I said, I told you not to chop down that tree. <laughs> the villagers to pull him away and drag him in limping. 
And of course, that was the last time. On another occasion, somebody uh, actually, some lay people, not just some villagers, very not knowing right or wrong, uh, would see all the abundance of offerings there and would think, well, I'll just take that. You know, they've got so much. And that's why I do this Sangadana, if you see on Sunday. It's so then that way, what is offered is totally offered to everyone and everyone can take portions of whatever what is offered here, what is shared, and do that weekly. So then people use these facilities without any sense of uh, the feeling that they're taking from it. What things have been freely given, such as free division books and things like that, you're partaking that because you're doing Sangadana. And this is correct to Dhamma Vinaya. So I had to explain that to the committee because they weren't understanding of that. So for explaining, putting a picture of a shrine. Because uh, here it's not a monastery, it's a... Uh, it's a centre, so just inviting monks to come and stay and then leave. And then you get many different monks from all walks. So this quality of uh, learning about monks' life, learning about their etiquette and supporting that etiquette, then we too can grow in Dharma and grow more confidence and, uh, and develop uh, good qualities of mind. And so this other person at the monastery took things and, uh, he, uh, and he recorded, Obublim recorded that, you know, he couldn't control that. You know, if people decide to do that, to even take thieving, take things away that are definitely not, you know, a property that they needed for the monastery. Uh, and uh, he said the heavy consequences that is, is, uh, is, is that of being born as an animal. He was born an animal in, the, in, the, in that monastery. So I'm not too sure if that one of those dogs was one of those villagers. <laughs> he met her. And sure. It probably is because of that strong bond, because maybe that villager was very kind and supportive of him, but still didn't really, because a lot of villagers are very, they don't have much education and quite rough. And their lives are very hard. So, and, and also... The etiquette is not totally always understand by every villager. And we can see that in, uh, in uh, these Asian cultures where they see a monk, they're afraid to, uh, to meet the monk. They walk the other direction. And that struck, struck, that struck me when I first, being a monk going to Dong in Asia and living in Asia for a very long time, why are they afraid of me? Because they know they're up to no good and they're afraid. They're afraid to meet me because of they know it's uh, if they're doing nothing, something not good in front of a monk, it's heavy karma. And they don't want to associate that. They don't want to think about that. They are caught in doing unwholesome things because of habit and tendency. And they may be involved in a gang, involved in corruption and so forth. And they've got no choice. Maybe since birth they've been involved in these kind of wheelings and dealings and they can't see no way out. So, uh, but this still shows that these rough people show respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. It shows that they respect and they still will honour and give support. And, uh, and uh, even so, uh, giving merit, these rough people that give merit, the Buddha said that dana is always useful. Even if they do give merit, the result is they will always will not be one to go without. Even if they're in a, in a low, woeful states, they will always still receive support because they supported. So in a sense, they are getting some ben they're getting benefits back from that aspect of doing good karma in a very, very basic level. And that's why the Lord Buddha never, never got involved with lay people's affairs and just saw what was suitable to teach, same as this great master, Lumpur Blim, he wouldn't get too involved. He would just say same things like, don't cut down that tree. He wouldn't make a big deal about it, saying that. Or he would teach precepts and people in the monastery about don't steal and things like that, but still there are people attempted and so forth and do that because of their coarse nature and don't really understand the benefits yet. And so he always encouraged to develop sila, one of the things, one of the hallmarks of him was to really develop sila and develop purity of the mind. Because with that sila, which is uh, uh, 
completely having no, no remorse, no regrets in any aspect, then that mind will go to peace and will go to samadhi. And the internal speaking and dialogues will, will, uh, will fall away. So now we're living in a world where there's much emphasis on teaching meditation techniques and ways to uh, develop one's uh, uh, focus of mind. But this uh, is also can be can considered a, a wrong sati or wrong samadhi because it's not on the basis of what the Lord Buddha taught. They're not going through uh, the stages of development, starting off with 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 dana. And dana in itself truly calms the mind down. It's truly goodness. It cushions the mind, helps the mind come calm and serene. It's the quality of being devoid of selfishness, delighting in in giving and sharing. And so this quality of delighting in giving and sharing, thus we are givers of material support. And so when we give material support, we're actually lifting someone out. We're carrying someone. It's like someone who's been had an accident and they're no longer capable. Or, or, you know, and you're lifting them up from an accident site. It's a great sense of, uh, uh, how would you say, um, duty one feels. This person's injured or harmed. I have to help them. They're beyond help themselves. And so too, Lord Buddha said to put the monks in an extreme state in society, and that is not in a classless state. In the time of the Buddha, there was these classes of society, such as the, uh, the high affluent class of, 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 of kings and, and, and ministers and princesses and so forth, and, and the merchant class, and uh, the, the, uh, also the, uh, the working class, those who have crafts and skills, and that of the, uh, the, uh, the, the lowest class being those of uh, just peasants and so forth, just um, don't own any property or land, and just working you know, as, a, as a servant or so forth like that, under a master or something like that. And, uh, and then the Lord says, you're, not, you're classless, you're homeless, you're outcast. This is the status I want you to have. And why he wanted that? He says, I want people to, to follow the, uh, this uh, ancient Aryan tradition of giving, giving support to monks. And the monks are pure and they are worthy of support. And thus, then the people come in contact with that. Then they see the, uh, the beauty, the quality of giving support. Because this monk, if food is not given to him, he will not eat that day. He will not eat that day. And I've done the experiments myself here to test my own determination. When there's no one doing dana that day, I'd say, I just tell them, don't bother anyone. I will just go bindabata and just see what I get. And it's wonderful just to put yourself on that edge where you don't really know what you're going to get. And when you do that, it's incredible the support you get. I was quite amazed. And then another occasion where one feels a bit nervous, one might be a lay person comes and says, I'll put this aside for you. In the morning they offer you something, put that aside for you. So you have some, something just in case you don't get much for bindabata. And then you go bindabata, you hardly get anything. It's quite incredible. It's almost, how do they, who's telling these people? <laughs> who's telling these people, you know? And that's, that, that is the power of goodness. When our minds are that determined to keep to our, our, our precepts, such as the level of monk or lay people, keep to the precepts of the five precepts and really work with that, it's something that will come and support us in those difficult times. Because the precepts are all about inconvenience. They create an inconvenience on us. And so that's what people, that's why people, we feel we should get joy in those occasions when we're giving support to other people. We're lifting them up. We're seeing they're worthy of support for what their, their noble aspirations are. We want to support that and we get joy. So I constantly remind the people, you know, may you be joyous and happy for the dana you're doing. May it bring a source of happiness for you. And they're all looking very sad. And I think, why is that? Why aren't they getting joy in doing dana? You know? And then I ask them, 
did someone push you to do dana? Do you feel inconvenient doing it? Do you feel happy on doing it? Why are you unhappy? Was it, you, was it too much trouble for you? You know, I'm sorry, you know, sorry to disturb you. Maybe, maybe, maybe like this and that. And then they can see themselves, oh, I, why am I feeling this, uh, this sadness? You know, well, you know why, why can I let go of my worries and concerns? This is what Dana is all about. It's just put it aside, all your worries and concerns. Really enjoy doing it. It's like when somebody is in danger and you're helping him, you're not thinking about yourself. You're totally worried, totally focused on that person helping them. It's a very powerful, liberating effect on the mind. And so then, like too, with giving service and support, you know, and this is where we see we're giving benefit. Why do we give service and support? Because we give benefit to others. And if other people are benefiting, we're benefiting. So like this, like this centre here, when we use things, we keep things clean and tidy. Like I've been training the people how to look after the kitchen and the facilities. When I first got here, it was a bit, a bit uh, not so good. And I was saying, this is not good. You know, this is not good that uh, other people come here. It's not polite to other people. It's not showing them, want to, not welcoming them. You know, so that's what we're doing. We're creating. Well, we've got, we have, we come to a place of convenience, so we make sure it's. When we leave, we also create inconvenience for other people. We're respecting that. That's why, uh, and then that way we feel create joy. You know, it's we, and then it actually trains us. Everything we do, we're always trying to keep neat and tidy and rip roy in everything we do, because it brings happiness. It's like if you see people who are who are not really concerned. You go in the room; it's clothes thrown here and there, and this and that. It just shows, this shows the state of their mind, you know. As soon as if you see something, you see something un, unneat, untidy, you just feel unhappy. You cleanly put it away. And this is, this is the quality where it strengthens the mind. To be neat is an actual quality of showing what, what we are in our mind. We're not worried, we're not agitated, things like that. We are simple in my mind and simple content in the present moment. So things are thrown here, thrown there, books here, books there, all over the place. What it's showing is the mind that's just lost. It's absolutely lost. It has no mindfulness at all. It's not happy. It's always grabbing this, grabbing that, and so forth. So then we're looking at that quality of service. And when we come to these centre places, they are showing that. Now, we can't just throw things around. It's very organised and rip raw everything. If you go to monasteries, it's the same. Other vihara is the same. So then we get inspired by that, and we want to do that as well in our own homes. We replicate, we create, we assimilate that 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 environment in our own homes. What we see in these centres and things like that, very beautifully organised place for sitting, meditation, shrine, so forth. And these things, uh, we're putting attention to detail. And it, and it taking away clutter from the mind. And this is another aspect of dana. This is the aspect of service, where we're really seeing the, the deeper levels, instead of like someone telling us, clean up your mess and do this and that, and we get annoyed, because we're immature. But those, those who are very mature, very responsible, just know this is, this is not right. This has to be you know, fixed up straight away. And having that energy of maturity, responsibility, it, it has an energy. People will follow you. People will, will take your lead. They will say, oh, I'll do like that. Such as uh, Lumpur Blim, when, we, when we're about to, uh, when we go to his kuti, if something's not in place, he will fold the blanket. And straight away the monks will go, oh, I, do, I forgot to fold that. Oh, terrible. A great master. Kuti absolutely rip Roy. Nothing, you know. And then he won't say anything. Who didn't fold my blanket? Who didn't put my books away? Who didn't look after? You know. And he's very careful who he gives things to do jobs for him. He says, oh, I don't want to give that to him. He's very irresponsible. So then there's even a specific monk that bathes him. And he knows exactly how he likes to be bathed. And he has a bathing cloth. He never undresses as well. And they, they soap him up and bathe him and give him his toothbrush. You know. That's absolutely beautiful. It's something, something like visiting 
historical uh, going back in time of the Lord Buddha, really showing that quality of what it was time like, like in the Lord Buddha and that quality. And also uh, uh, the quality of washing his feet and bathing it so when he walks into the place they're clean, having that concern. It just shows all these little things uh, which I discuss and they're centred to with just to understand. So that's why monks, all oh, monks are very particular, very fussy about things I didn't realise. That's because they're holding, upholding the Aryan lineage, the Aryan lineage of the noble ones. And so how do we uphold it? If we have met these great masters and they come from traditions of great forest monks and so forth. And so when we put up a shrine, there's all these qualities embodying us. You know, speaking with one of the committee members and uh, we were saying that, <clears throat> that uh, you know, what do we have as monks really? You know, lay people, they have movies, entertainments, things and that, going parties and engagements and this and that, activities. But monks, our, our, our life is so very small, minimal. We only have our great reverence to our teachers, shrines, uh, our, our, our memories of the teacher, uh, our recordings of him, and, and talks, and, uh, and also our, our, our own practice, our own development. And so we're honouring that all the time. We're showing reporting and all the rituals that the monks have to learn showing about respect. And this is quite difficult for lay people because they're not level to that refinement in life. Because they're saying, oh, I've just so many problems, I'm not peaceful, I'm not calm, I'm not concentrated. You know, I want to be peaceful, calm and concentrated. Please help me. And when, they, when, I, when they come and I ask them, you know, you know, may you rejoice in your goodness and your happiness of doing dana. And this is the time now of learning to do dana. As Westerners, we have to learn to do dana. It's, it's, it's vital. We have to learn. It's something we never learned. Or I was involved in a sangha and uh, dharma practice when I first got in contact. I really wanted to support the monks, I even help them with lifts and things like that, whatever they needed support. Because I really honoured, I really thought what they are doing is truly worthy of noble honouring. I, you know, I want them to maintain their precepts as best they can, to support that, that maintaining that, you know. So then that way, uh, and of course, being a male is much more easier for them. So it was likewise. But never mind. This, there's that quality we 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 want to help to maintain and help to learn and get to know them and learn. What it is, what it is, what is this meaning of you know monks, the sangha? What does this mean? What does it imply? This tradition, this lineage of Aryan disciples, of noble ones. And then finally, the last quality of of dana is that of of uh, of giving fearlessness, and that is one where we're just absolutely uh, giving this sense of security and stability to others and that's what the five precepts all about and and when you explain it in a certain way which i've been recently doing just exploring it with westerners and, and saying for example your neighbor if you have a neighbor and he he harms beings he's bloody handed carries a uh, a weapon and uh, merciless uh, not kind to all beings and uh, and uh, cruel and uh, will will from time to time will harm beings in his backyard. He's your neighbour and you, how would you feel? You hear some screeching or something like that, you would feel totally afraid. You feel, oh, terrible. Oh, what's he doing? What's he harming? What's he hurting? Oh, I don't, don't want this kind of neighbour. So then we see ourselves, it's something, it doesn't make us feel comfortable at ease if we know that. Or well, same if somebody says there's a, there's a villain coming in here and he's armed, everyone would be afraid for their lives. No one would be f so, so giving this sense of fearless is that that's what we give because we're unarmed, we're, we're, we're peaceful, harmless, not harming each other, respectful, kind. And that's what this first precept is about, giving fearlessness. There's no sense to be any fear at all. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it an absolutely wonderful gift? I want to promote that. 
So then that is that we're undoing that evil desire of, of, of harm, you know? No, we aspire to be harmless, not harming anyone. To the point it even goes further, we take it even to a much more refined level where it's even in our speech, not just in our physical actions, also in our speech. We're creating this quality of non, non harming, not getting involvement, not yelling, not backbiting. You know, even though we feel we, we want to, we should not, because it's making the other person feel already more anxiety. I'm annoyed, now they're annoyed, now we're going to be even both more annoyed because of that confrontation. So that's a quality of fearlessness. We can just walk away and leave it to another time where we're calm and maybe settle it in a more mature manner. And so with that quality of fearlessness, we, we, we can see go, going into, in each precept, that is what it gives, such as uh, uh, not taking that what is not given, not stealing. Again, if you knew your neighbour was, was somebody like a, a thief and, uh, and doing all, up to, all up, up to no good and everything, you'd be always worried, I need more security in my house, I need another alarm and things like that. So would you feel very unease in their company? You feel your property's not safe. We're for here, people will leave their bags and then we'll put it aside and we'll say, oh, you left your property, we'll even call them and things like that. So it's the opposite. So people feel so at ease, they even sometimes leave their property here. <laughs> so it just shows that people feel this is it's a very safe place, very neutral place. But still, we should be careful of our property. <laughs> And uh, so, so we see, that's what we, when we see that, we quite clearly want to give those qualities of fearlessness, sense of safety, promoting that. And people feel, you know, nothing to disturb the mind. I feel totally safe with this person, feel totally at ease. And also, again, with the precepts on sexuality is that one knows, one, one, is, one's, one, is, uh, one can trust one's partner. One won't be uh, uh, committing adultery, and there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, that, there's that respect in that relationship and one won't do illegal, unlawful acts to dealing with sexuality, get involved in all sorts of uh, evil, corruption and so forth and all the, pollute, all the pollution that goes around with it. But keep it to a moderate sense where it's, it's a proper perspective for, 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 for people in society such as having a family and so forth you know, or loving relationships and so forth. And that, and that, this is uh, this is uh, what the Lord Buddha inspired us to have free freedom of uh, of negativity in the mind. And thus, with these qualities, we can we can go further with uh, that equality of our speech and our speech, which is uh, which is uh, beautiful, because of those already free levels of our of our bodily contact have been uh, very calmed down and it further on with our speech we'll be careful to how we present truth we're always trying to present truth and uh, avoiding negativity in the mind and uh, trying to uh, speak in positive and, and, and ways that are helping to support each other And thus, with the body peaceful and composed to the extent of non-harming, with the speech also beautifully composed, well restrained, we train in this goodness of speaking. And thus, it's useful, we will say it. If it's a supporting factor for others, we will say it. If it's in the growth of dharma towards other people, we will say it. And oneself and others having such words of moderate, not foolish, reasonable, not unreasonable, beneficial, not beneficial, and aiming at uh, truly non-deception, but truthfulness, non maliciousness non-harming, non-aggressive or impolite sp speech. And thus, one rejoice in this quality of all this speech leads to one thing, and that is conquer, conquer and harmony, promoting togetherness. And thus such a person shies away from harsh speech, gossip, backbiting, and truly composed and peaceful in regard to speech. So this is, this is the benefits of, of beautiful speech. We can see is that when we are containing ourselves more and more, and these actives of body and speech 
that we're containing. It's like we have something smelly in a container, something rotten and smelling. We put a lid on it. No one else can smell it. No one else can smell it. As soon as you open that lid, everyone smells it. And that's what it's like when I was saying with somebody who's, who harms people straight away, that flavor of rum, people know, people wear, oh, what's that terrible smell? Ooh. They want to, you know, try to get rid of it. And that's what we feel if our neighbor's like that. Ooh, terrible, you know. So it's creating this tension in the mind. But us, we also have these qualities. It's not like we're all, we're all uh, perfect angels. We all have these tendencies, the Lord Buddha says. Even an infant, when it's born, even though an infant, a little child, we're rocking in our hand, and people say, oh, so pure, so innocent. But actually, it's not pure and innocent. All these defilements are, are laying dormant within it because it's born. And that which is born will die. And that which is die will born, will be born again. And will continue to do so, whether in a human form, animal form, or in the form of a deva, so forth. So even so young and so beautiful, and you can say, but they, it, it's inherent and are waiting for causes and conditions to make them come forth. And that's why we see when when we have good parenting, good upbringing, we can really affect that child, really steer him into a good way. Where for a child that doesn't get much good parenting, good care because of, uh, because of uh, misfortune, born, born in a very uh, terrible state, maybe in a violent country where there's always war and conflict, never known peace and stuff like that. And uh, their behavior is because of that, because of its society. So us living in uh, such a very peaceful, civilized society, we have now we already have to go more level to a more deeper level of yeah, of uh, having this stability in our society. It's continually trying to improve to a level so where we can perfect our sila. So that way, when we sit, we sit peacefully with no remorse, no regret, what what we have done. And so when this container of holding this, this, this smell, Lord Buddha says, and this is what we're looking at, this quality of, of what can be abandoned by speech but not by body, and what can be abandoned by body but not by speech, and what can be abandoned neither by body, neither by body nor speech. And this is this last aspect where it, we've contained it. This sort of smell in this, in this jar, we're containing it. It's still within us. And therefore the precepts that were given to lay laity are perfect to reach to a level of, of peace and security and happiness. That should be enough. So whether you're rich or poor is not the point. Is that is the quality. When you develop that, you develop a quality of integrity and inner happiness and contentment with what you have, this is important. Not the new iPhone or the new car or new this, which societies keep on telling us, oh, very good, thank you for the lovely information, but I'm content. <laughs> we can be like that. And uh, no moderation. And so our speech is clearing up those coarse aspects where those defilements come out through speech, such as uh, if... Uh, people we don't like and we want to get back to them, we will use certain speech to break them up. Or if there's a being we, we, we want to eliminate, we want to take them away, we will use bodily action, harming them. So that's the, our, the farmers are working through these different doors, what they can do. But let's say something like a, a, a thought or an idea, a defiled idea such as pondering and wonderings of uh, being boiled in anger, being boiled with hate, or being boiled with resentment or negativity and that's lingering in the mind, that's like being contained. It's like something that's, that's creating much stress in ourselves. And the Lord Buddha says the only way to abandon that is be by repeatedly being seen. And when it's repeatedly been seen by wisdom, wisdom abandons it. This is harmful. This does not help me. I abandon that way. 
I abandon my jealousy. I abandon my hatred. This is not beneficial to me. I abandon it. One sees it arise in the mind and one abandons it. Because that is the only way we can do it on that level of defilement. Because it's just a thought, an idea in the mind that's going over and over due to uh, incorrect understanding of Dharma, understanding ourselves. And so these qualities that we uh, have incorrect understanding are free, and that is of that of um, <clears throat> longing, having this deep longing for other people's properties, the Lord Buddha says, this nature of always thinking, I want this, I want that, and this is not good enough, I need that, always this longing, and this is a, this, this, this craving, this desire for bettering, improving, not content. What, what's wrong with now? You know, what's wrong with what I have now? Why do I need something better, improving this and that? This is good enough. Learning to make the most of what I have and look after that. And that will calm down. Always trying to calm that down. Because if that is in the mind, there is no mindfulness at all. Because when we're working with the mind, which we can, the Lord Buddha says we can, we can see it, we have to recognise it, and not give, not give it, give it way, not, not, not add to its thoughts and ideas, but just say, no, this is the wrong way of thinking. This is inappropriate and abandon it. And the second aspect is that of ill will and negativity, having aversion, ill will. And we can see when that arises in the mind, we see this is not helpful at all. And we abandon that also. And the funny thing, when we do abandon these qualities of longing or desire, strong desire for things on and on and on, when we're not content, or we abandon these qualities of ill will, negativity, uh, backbiting or wanting to get back at people, wanting to win, wanting to uh, satisfy our envy or jealousy, when we, when we abandon these qualities, what is there? What is there? And the quality when we abandon longing is that we're content. When we truly abandon it, we are content. No, it's good enough. What I have now, what I am, what I am or what I have to give and offer and what I do is what I, is good enough. Don't need to you know, look, seek, go here, go there, run around and get all caught up in that. Or the other aspect with ill will negativity is to, is to abandon, abandon that quality and then we see there's only kindness and compassion. Because if we have ill will or no negativity, then all those situations that created that, now we change and we see them with understanding and compassion. This is opportunity for me to now to understand where before I would get angry and negative about those things. Now I would change my perception and try to understand this person who's angry, this person who's trying to make me angry, or this person who's irritating. Try to understand them. Try my best to understand them, have compassion for them. And this brings about a huge transformation in the mind. It's like dumping a very heavy luggage that we've been carrying with us. And of course we lose out. That's the whole idea. They win. This is why that we uphold these qualities of longing, ill will. It's because we lose out. But what we lose out on is more freedom and peace in the mind and anxiety and worry and all the, all the tension and and anxieties that come with fighting and bickering with other people is all, is all fallen away. And then finally is the wrong view. It's the highest of all, is that right view. The Lord Buddha said, once we establish ourselves in right view and truly have respect for it, because right view is all about respect, and that is we have respect for what has been given. We have respect for what is offered and we respect for what is sacrificed. Because we consider if nothing's given and everything's taken, nothing's offered and everything's kept away from us, 
and nothing sacrificed, then truly our human society will fall apart in sense of compassion and understanding and supporting each other. Because what we're doing here are already those three things. We're giving, we're offering, and we're sacrificing. You decided to come here to sacrifice your time. That's sacrifice for a common cause, not just because you uh, see it beneficial for yourself, but also probably also on a high lofty thought, this benefits others. If I come here, I was supporting something good. And I can give support, also dana, you know, for the Sunday meal, or helping running the centre or whatnot, and meeting people and so forth. So these qualities are there, present with us. And then there is fruits from, from good and bad actions. And this is something we start to learn about through our life and experience. Oh yes, when I do bad, it comes back on me. And even the newspaper say it, what comes around goes around. So what, if that's not a statement from karma, I don't know what is, you know? Or a footy player does something terrible, or, or the Aussie cricket captain does an act of deception to uh, do something to the cricket ball so it, they can win the game and then they feel all great and then they're totally, totally uh, embarrassed and totally lost all recognition of that winning. You know, this, is, this is a quality of, uh, you can see that quality of, uh, of um, <clears throat> receiving the fruits of our karma, doing something not honest. And thus we can see that quite clearly, then we're more inclined, no, I won't do that. Let them win. If I lose, let me just improve myself. Let me content what I have, what I am. Let me just work with myself, work with my own karma to the best of my ability. And finally, there is, uh, moving on from that, till we finally understand right view that there is this world and the next world and there is mother, there is father and there is being spontaneously being born and there are Brahmins, ascetics uh, uh, ascetics meaning monks, monastics who are well practice who have come to direct realization and uh, and that direct realization is understanding these four noble truths. And then this leads into deeper and deeper into right view. And this is what we're adding great value respect. And this is the highest of all the kusala kamas that I've been talking about. First on the area of the body, on the, on the area of the speech, and in the area of the mind. So the one of the mind is the most important one we understand. We see it in our minds and we repeatedly see it with wisdom. We pay attention to it when it arises. We don't just uh, get in, entertain it. We consider it, this is not appropriate. This is not appropriate. I have to abandon that. And then more we abandon, what replaces? You'll see definitely great, great improvements in peace. It's because of that quality of sila leads to the peaceful mind leads to the state of, of non-agitation where the mind is restless, more less, not restless, but calm and serene. So I encourage you all to keep on with your Dharma practice, keep on working and developing right view. So then you truly are honouring and respecting it in every way, all those points that the Lord Buddha talked about. And even the ones which we don't understand, such as there is this world and next world, we can still consider every person who's near their last moments of their breath, how afraid they are, where am I going, what is going to happen to me. If we've ever been close with someone as they're dying, it's quite a profound effect to say they're no longer with us, where have they gone? Is that it? They just die and there's nothing? This is the atheist view. And if that is true, there's nothing, then what does this tell the mind? It tells the mind to be heedless, reckless, 
I can do what I like. And thus, they just lose themselves in all forms of worldly, bodily pleasure. And there's never enough. It goes on and on and then they die. They don't care. But they don't die very peacefully. So may you continue to develop right view and work with all those areas with great respect and uh, deepen oneself in one's contemplation on Dharma, giving time importance of it and uh, finding the appropriate learning, the skill of living in society in the appropriate balanced way. So that way it's not too uh, involved and not too disinvolved but moderately. And so then that way, when we are moderate, such as the precepts, which promote moderateness in our behaviour, it gives great benefit and support to other people, not just ourselves. Thus, may you all uh, go forward and bring quality of fearlessness wherever you go. Evang.